Welcome back to Curious Monica, where we learn how to thrive in different jobs. And oh, how nice it is to be back in the studios with you. Thanks for your patience as we took a break in May due to our busy projects at Innovators Box. But now, I'm back. And with more news stories just in time for you to step into your summer plans. You'll be adding us to your listening list as you map out your summer schedules, right? Well, today, I'm excited to invite you all to dive into a field that we hear about often in the news. Politics. Honestly, tell me your thoughts. When you think of someone working in politics, what's the first word that comes to mind? Powerful, hypocritical, passionate. Good speakers. For me, one thing that came up was that this was a job for men. This inaccurate depiction of the field was understandable as the only exposure I had of people in politics growing up was what I saw on TV. Men arguing, speaking, doing speeches, and saying what the new policies were. And that's what I grew up hearing both in South Korea and in the United States. I didn't know how diverse the field was, nor how many females were already paving the way until I first interned at Capitol Hill during my high school program at Madeira School in Falls Church, Virginia. As I walked through those corridors, I noticed how people who worked in politics were doing so much more fun, impactful, and busy work as compared to what I saw on TV as a young girl. It certainly still piqued my curiosity of wondering why women are still a minority and what it really means to succeed in politics. I understand that there are lots of people out there who want government to be as limited as possible, but I believe that government could be the foundation and should be the foundation that creates a strong community. And when you are surrounded by a strong community, you will become a stronger person. I, there's tons of research around that. So those are the things that Uh, that drive me. As a woman running for office, I wouldn't say only in the state of Georgia, but any public office, not only in the U.S., but around the world, there is such a heightened level of violence and assault against women in public office. Cyberbullying is tremendous. Just look at, you know, like the Twitter interactions of of really well-known women politicians, you know, from our own all the way to those overseas. I mean, the amount of vitriol and and assault that they gain on, on the cyberspace is unprecedented. Hi, welcome to Curious Monica by Innovators Box, where we study how different people thrive at different jobs. I'm your host, Monica King, and today, I'm excited to dive into politics. How do you build a career in politics? What does it mean to work there? Okay, so we can't answer all the questions, but I do feel there is something powerful we can learn by taking a closer look into two people who are playing a key role in Atlanta, Georgia. One is helping other women get into office, and one is running for office. As always, I'm curious to learn, unlearn, and understand. And the first question I wonder is, do people start in politics because they know they will love it? For Nicole Horn, the answer was yes. (laughs) I've loved politics since I was 16. So I've been uh, one of those people who watched Meet the Press every Sunday was, you know, heartbroken when Tim Russert passed and became a little bit more involved in local politics uh, through Atlanta public schools. Um, when your children's, when your children go to public school, you have to get involved. Nicole Horn wears many hats and has had many jobs before running for labor commissioner in 2022 in Atlanta, Georgia. From waitressing at Waffle House to TV reporting to owning her own business and serving as a corporate executive, she had constantly thought about what it means to balance a budget for a business and looking out for her people. As a mother who wanted to shape what her kids would experience in the future, 
stepping back into politics was a key way to serve. But to understand Nicole's passion for politics, we have to start with how she became an entrepreneur. She came to understand her passions for having a voice and being a go-getter because of how she felt as a TV reporter who had opinions that differed from how current affairs were moving during the presidency of George W. Bush. I realized that I I had an opinion about what he was doing and the direction he was going, and I didn't feel like I could I didn't feel like I could stay unbiased. So I was engaged at the time and I called my husband, my fiance, and I said, John, I'm going to get out of local news. I'm going to do documentaries. And his response was, how much does that pay exactly? So we made this deal. He had just started. He had just transitioned his company to begin working with universities. And we made this deal that I would come and work with him. This was very early in his company. It was 2002. And we, we, we blew up together. We, what I'm really great at is building relationships and sales. And what he was really good at was more of the back of the house. So it's like a restaurant. I was the front of the house. He was the back of the house. And I got so much pleasure and enjoyment out of creating strategy, creating new products, that once I got my fingers into it, I just, I didn't want to let go. The joy of not wanting to let go certainly lingered as she and her husband continued to serve many customers and communities for 16 years until they sold their company in 2018. And as she continued to witness how her community was empowered, she realized she had to get involved. The challenge about Atlanta public schools, that, which is the challenge we face in Atlanta and Georgia more broadly, is that there's a big difference between the haves and have-nots. So trying to have a voice and advocating for my elementary school as the PTO president, uh, but also recognizing that my advocacy, that you have to walk the line between, because uh, unfortunately, the pie is pretty solid. It's not something you can grow easily. So figuring out how can you create a win-win situation, with, especially with kids who have so much less than our kids do, um, and getting involved in that and advocating for things like pushing more money down to the schools and out of central administration, and that got me going. And then Trump won. And that really was a kick in the pants to get much, much, much more involved. I started an indivisible fifth group, um, our own indivisible group to start uh, sending regular emails, having activities, just advocating for change and advocating against some of the goals that President Trump had, which I just didn't agree with. So it's been uh, a lot of just local civic involvement that has led to more of a push against what was going on the last four years. And when we sold the company, I said, okay, well, it's time to throw my hat into the ring. She isn't the only one who felt that way about the past four years. The Trump administration's leadership style has put all stakeholders on edge, both Democrats and Republicans. While we will not discuss details in respect to being a nonpartisan podcast, in the context of our conversation of building a career in politics, you can see why it's so crucial that you reflect upon why you care about what you advocate for and what party you are with. The two parties don't always have to be against one another, but knowing what you care about, believe in, and what you want to advocate for helps you understand how you might contribute to public service. In Nicole's case, she realized why she wanted to run for Atlanta's labor commissioner in 2022. So I asked her, why? Why this role and what does it mean to be a labor commissioner? Monica, that's a great and completely relevant question. So I am lucky enough where I live, I have two amazing uh, representatives for the State House and the State Senate, um, who are phenomenal women who contribute a lot. So there was no way on earth that I was going to run against them. I value their voice. 
Senator Elena Parent and Representative B. Wynn. There are people who they're local now, but I hope they'll be national names sometime in the future. So I'm super lucky that way. I didn't want to run for the Atlanta School Board. <laughs> I had no interest in that. Um, so I started thinking about my job and my company. So as I was guiding universities and choosing what programs to launch, what programs to market, what people needed, I spent a lot of time in the Department of Labor data. So I'm constantly watching what occupations are growing, what industries are shrinking, what's the hot job now. Most states, the Department of Labor manages that labor data, as well as workforce investment money. And that's money that goes towards training if you lose a job. That's not the case in Georgia. In Georgia, it's labor data and unemployment and paying unemployment benefits. Georgia, in Georgia, that's been a huge problem. Right now, the Department of Labor leader is actually being sued because there's a backlog between 50 and 60,000 people. And if you are living paycheck to paycheck, people aren't able to pay their rent. They're not able to put food on the table. They're not able to pay for heat as the weather changes. So as I learned more, um, I just the drive to make change grabbed me. For those of your listeners or viewers who are into technology, to give a little bit of a back end, Georgia's Department of Labor unemployment system is run on a programming language called COBOL. COBOL was built in 1959. Universities stopped teaching it in the 80s, and it's typically run on a mainframe. So that's part of why our unemployment system isn't working well. It's because it's on ancient technology and, and it's just, there's not any excuse. Um, Mark Butler, who is the current labor commissioner took office in 2011 and he's had plenty of time to change it. So it's time. And that's, that's one of my priorities. Along with there's ways that um, some states actually help you use your unemployment money to start a company, which is fantastic. Um, and in Georgia, we're lucky enough to have tons of nonprofits and agencies and other government agencies that an effective labor department should be working shoulder to shoulder with to strengthen labor in Georgia. In other words, being a labor commissioner means that you are ensuring that all workers are treated fairly under the law and are overseeing the administration of state laws relating to labor and the workforce. It's the state-level position in all 50 states in America, and a role that I could easily see Nicole in based on her journey. She has seen the gaps firsthand between those who have and haven't. Speaking of which, Jane Kim Calisius is another person who got into politics because she saw a gap in the workplace that needed to be addressed. Yes. Hi. So happy to be here. Thank you, Monica, for having me. Uh, I'm Jane, and I am a gender equality specialist that works in traditionally male-dominated industries. So I've been in uh, the nuclear industry, foreign policy, national and international security, and now in state politics. Today, she is also the executive director of Her Turn, a Georgia-based initiative created to recruit progressive women to run for public office at the state level. But like Nicole. To understand her passion for gender equality and politics, we have to look at her whole journey to see how she got there. Jane, did you know you'd be who you are today when you started your career? Okay, well, that's <laughs> everybody has their own story, right? The origin, the OG story. Just to answer the latter part of your question, it was definitely not something that I thought I would be involved in when I was, uh, you know, studying or, you know, growing up, what would you like to be? It was never, it was never a question for me. But how did I get into this? So, um, you know, back in the days, <laughs> like after I graduated college, we had the, the, the United States had a um, recession and there was a lot of hiring freezes because I always wanted to work in government. I always wanted to serve the U United States. And when when the government had the hiring freeze, I thought, well, you know, I maybe this is an opportunity for me to do something totally different, just kind of enjoy my time because I was in my early 20s. 
yeah, no obligations. So I could just, you know, pack my bags and go. So I decided to go to South Korea, which is uh, where my uh, relatives live. And that's also where my family is from. And, you know, just do like random um, gigs. What it, I did a lot of kind of like teaching English and translating and just, you know, working for law firms or universities, just doing a lot of kind of English to Korean, Korean to English kind of work. So it was a great to have that freedom. And during that time, I got involved with the nuclear industry and became a field officer for a nonprofit that's based in uh, Vienna, Austria. And that kind of led one thing to another, just did my job really well. And they liked me. So they invited me over to Vienna to work in their headquarters, uh, which then led me to like a bigger UN agency, you know, that works on a similar, um, that works on the same industry, basically. This is around the time I met Jane in Vienna in 2012. I was a grad school intern at the MV office the United States Department of State's Vienna office that oversaw work with the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. A mutual friend introduced us saying we might find common interest. And we sure did as we lamented over our Viennese coffee at how this industry we loved lacked diversity. Over the years, Jane turned this awareness into questions she could take action on. Where can I bring change? My role really was, a lot of my role was around communication. It was around uh, building partnerships. It was around um, just kind of telling the story of why we need to do what we needed to do. So I was then responsible for um, the gender equality portfolio for this bigger UN agency. And so... That kind of led one thing to another. Um, After that, I got really connected with a lot of people who are also working in different industries, but tackling the same kind of questions. So I kind of pivoted into consulting for a while. And then that also then led me to also working in politics as well uh, when when it comes so that we could talk about um, gender representation. A windy road indeed, but a purposeful one along each moment. Tell me a bit more about gender equality. Why is it important and why should we care? How can we break this down for someone who has never thought of it before? Um, that's, that's, that's something I can't, you know, put it in a nutshell for you. <laughs> um, but I think I like to think about it this way. So when you are executing a decision, whether that's launching a product, delivering a program, um, whichever industry or area you are in, you should always be thinking about the user experience, the beneficiary of that certain product or policy or whatever that you are pushing out. And so the question is, if you as the maker or the body is not representative of those who will be receiving your product, how successful can it be? And I think that is what really um, I think about all the time when I look at, for instance, in in politics, you know, it's all about legislating policies that make lives better. So who who is who is being who is recipient of these policies? Who's benefiting? Is everybody benefiting or is it just a select few? You know, and if and you understand then, okay, well, then who's making the laws and why is it made that way? And because if there's not a very diverse group of people making the law, how does that relate to the impact down the road to those who are supposed to receive these benefits? And a lot of times, you know, so many people get unaccounted for. And I think that's, that for me, that's what kind of gender equality or any kind of equity or equality is, is that do you have a representative body that is making representative decisions? Repeat that last part. Do you have a represented body making representative decisions? Representation matters. How can you design something for someone when you don't have a team member who understands or speaks for that voice? This is why in the past episodes, we spoke about the importance of intentionally designing diversity and inclusion in your product development, workplace design, leadership, and also in how your state leadership is formed. Jane, 
Why did you know being a gender equality expert was what you wanted to do? Especially as someone who has had other diverse careers. Great question. I would say two things have merged together to make that happen. Is first of all, I just kind of fell into the role in, in like my early career and I stuck with it. <laughs> quite frank, quite honestly. There was an opportunity, I took it and I did well in it. So, you know, and I and I realized that there's a lot more opportunity to do more. So that was one aspect, you know, just kind of going with the flow in a sense. And the second thing is when I was in college for my undergrad, so I have a degree, a bachelor in both um, anthropology and history, and then a master's in data analytics. But during my undergrad, my favorite course um, was cultural anthropology led by Professor George Mentor. And to this day, it has literally just kind of, I would say, impacted me in a way how I look at how things are made. And, you know, one thing that he always said was, always think about who is left out of the story. When it comes to, you know, like building something or even as something as simple as seatbelts, you know, you think about seatbelts, it's like, oh yeah, that's, you always have to think about who is being left out when we talk about seatbelts. So it's kind of a really weird way to think about it, but really it talks about how we take things for granted. And with that, what are we not thinking about? And that's also the same as gender equality when it comes to representation, whether that is in leadership positions, in the workforce, or even in the user, the user experience slash beneficiaries, who is being left out? You know, and I think that has always been kind of a interesting critical thinking point for me. And so when when that and you know, just kind of like going into gender equality as an early career position and just kind of staying there because it worked well, just kind of when that meshes together, that's how I am here today. <laughs> Always ask, who is left out of the picture? Wow. We will be surprised who shows up upon reflecting. Jane's journey reminded me how important it is that we remember how we got to where we are. Now, as the executive director at her term, she is not only helping more female candidates get the support they need to run for office, but also providing the courage, confidence, and resources to help people learn how to run for office in her current state of Georgia. And while there has been growth, challenges still exist. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm more excited about is that women, especially women of color, are finally being recognized for all the hard work that they have been doing for decades. What we have seen in terms of the organizing as well as the election results in Georgia just didn't happen overnight. There's a spirit of organizing here in Georgia as well as kind of one of the cradles of the civil rights movement as well. And, you know, oftentimes it was mostly communities of color, women of color also as well, who are, you know, having to bear the brunt of all these things, um, really pushing to make changes. So that's just kind of really coming to the forefront here now in, in 2020 and beyond. And I'm really excited that it has been nationally recognized. And that means much more opportunity to highlight all of these behind the scenes under the rug kind of work that has been doing. And, you know, especially the women of color finally gaining the recognition that they so deserve. Having said that, you know, as, as a woman running for office, I wouldn't say only in the state of Georgia, but any public office, not only in the U.S., but around the world, there is such a heightened level of violence and assault against women in public office cyberbullying is tremendous just look at you know like the twitter interactions of, of really well-known women politicians from our own all the way to those overseas i mean the amount of vitriol and and assault that they gain on on the cyberspace is unprecedented and a lot of times those things happen just for the fact that they were born as a woman in during the 2020 elections time, I have worked with over 30 candidates, uh, women candidates here in the state of Georgia running for different positions at the state legislator level. And 
the amount of hate that they receive, just unfounded, you know, it's just like they could be just walking down the grocery store and somebody would just come up and just yell at them just for the, just because they are running for office and because they feel like they can do it because she's a woman. They're not running for some sort of glory or for some sort of a title. They're actually really wanting to make real changes, you know, and they're sacrificing also, you know, their their safety and their family safety as well to to make better change. And so I think that's what really worries me is that harassment and assault based on an individual sex when they are running for public office is not going down. And uh, we need to we need to protect them. <laughs> This is the reason why when I asked Nicole what is important, she speaks about bravery as a skill set to thrive in politics or really any career. Be brave. Be brave. Be willing to be wrong. You don't want to live your life asking what if. You don't want to live your life second guessing yourself. So I, I think I need to tie be brave with be brave and live by your values. So tying those two things together ensures that you won't live life asking what if. And if you're leading with your values, you know that your bravery is going to result in hopefully some positive impact, whether it be small or significant, those pushes in the right direction improve the world. Bravery. Indeed. When you know your why, what you stand for, and are determined to not let challenges stop you, opportunities are everywhere. Jane also shared some tough love, but truthful reminders about where to focus, self-care, and self-development. The advice is really just have a very frank expectation of the challenges and the opportunity. I think, you know, and really there is not a lot of place for ego. This is, this is really an uphill battle and people will say and do really terrible and mean things, not because of who you are, what your values are, what your upbringings are, or, but simply because of the fact that you are a woman. And I think that's really, really hard to take on, especially for a lot of these candidates who are really accomplished in their careers. You know, and perhaps the negative feedback they had were like quarrels with colleagues during the meeting or perhaps something negative in the performance management review or something, you know, and to kind of just suddenly be kind of faced with this like unfiltered hate, you know, it, it really takes a toll and it's really hard. So you need to really have a strong conviction about who you are, self-love for yourself, and also the knowledge that these comments or or behaviors is not really reflecting who you are as a person right it's reflecting the other person who's speaking those things who's saying those things and i think being able to kind of have that understanding i think that's that's really important important reminders the social media and internet world has made it hard to know what is private or public but that doesn't mean what you read online defines you. That's true, no matter where you work, and especially in a public role like politics. Still, what I was empowered to learn from both Nicole and Jane is that you have the power to lead the narrative and change you want to see. Run for office, build expertise, speak up, and write and live your truth. You. Never know who else you could empower and what ripple effect of change this may lead to. Thank you both again for sharing your stories and doing what you do. Speaking of stories, ever curious about what it's like to be an author? How do you, they decide what to write about and why do they write? As a fellow author, I was eager to learn what motivated my author friends, but also learn what helped them be the author they are. Some even full time. Curious to learn more? Join me at our next Curious Monica episode. Hi, I'm Sam, an audio engineer at Innovators Box. 
and I hope you're enjoying Curious Monica. Creativity is something I've loved about all of my careers, whether it's been designing interactive games to help preschoolers learn through play, or by creatively fielding questions from high schoolers in Saturday morning detention. <laughs> this show is brought together by our awesome podcast team, producer Sarah No, audio engineer Sam Lamert and Ravi Lod, website designer Akriti Pandey, graphic designer Monica Escobar, and Luke Helder on music. And of course, this show is hosted and directed by the curious woman herself, Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. To continue the curiosity and creativity of the workplace, visit us at innovatorsbox.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and share. Would love to hear what you're curious about and what mysteries Monica can uncover in our next episodes. We'll see you next week. This is your host, Monica Kang at Innovators Box. I'll see you again soon.